We're continuing our series uh, in Matthew's Gospel, and today we're reading from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, through to Matthew chapter 10, verse 15. Uh, you can follow along in your Bibles at home. They're not pew Bibles, even though I keep saying that. Uh, you can follow along on the screen, or you can follow along in the service sheets that you might have printed out. Matthew chapter 9, beginning of verse 35. Then Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road leading to the other nations and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. You've received free of charge, give free of charge. Don't take along gold, silver or copper for your money belts. Don't take a travelling bag for the road or any extra shirt, sandals or a walking stick for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. I assure you, It will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray before we dive in to what Matthew has set before us. Dear Father, thank you for your word. As we've already prayed today, we pray that our hearts may not be hardened, that our ears will be open, that our minds will be transformed, that our eyes will see and so that our mouths and our lives and our desires, our tongues, our hands, our feet are transformed as we go out as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's an outline there uh, in the service or on the screen. Uh, There's an opportunity for you to follow along using that outline down the end of this uh, webpage is a comments box. Uh, It's been a great delight to receive comments, questions and queries uh, over the last few weeks. And so let me encourage you that if you have any questions about uh, the passage that we're looking at, the sermon, uh, indeed the introduction uh, and the process moving forward, please put them there in that comments box and Neil or I will endeavour to get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, Matthew might be a Jewish tax collector. He might be stark in a small Middle Eastern province of the vast Roman Empire. Matthew may have been a Capernaum kid his whole life. But Matthew has a global perspective as he writes about the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen again to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. For Matthew, I'm at point one on the outline. This is the genesis, literally, of a significant moment in the world, a moment that is akin to a new creation. For Matthew, this is the moment in the life, death and resurrection of this man, Jesus Christ, when God's commitment to roll back sin and bring his approval back to the whole world will have come to fulfilment. As you scan through the genealogy that Matthew has constructed in the rest of chapter 1, you cannot help but notice that this man, Jesus, is for the benefit of all kinds of people. For Matthew, what he's writing is good news for the whole world the promise of God to deal with the broken state of the world by dealing with its root cause sin is for all people. 
But whilst that concern is clear in the opening section, uh, we've been limited in scope, haven't we? Uh, Jesus has worked within a very small area of a very small Middle Eastern province of the vast and immense Roman Empire. He's worked in a little triangle circled around Capernaum, close to where all his current close friends have also grown up and lived their whole life. How is this concern for all peoples on earth going to come to fruition from this little triangle in Capernaum? Now, let me say that as we begin to look at what that looks like, a lot of the ideas, at least the basic structure of this passage, I've taken from a guy called Frederick Dale Brunner. Uh, He's written a commentary on Matthew chapters 1 to 12, the Christ book. Uh, It is brilliant. Uh, It's insightful and thinks outside the box. It's orthodox and it is very provocative. So I just want to acknowledge my incredible debt to the stuff that he's written on this section. Uh, Dale Brunner, Matthew chapters 1 to 12, the Christ book. Uh, Matthew wants to remind us again, I'm at point two on the outline, Matthew wants to remind us again of Jesus' work. Uh, Just look again at verse 35. Then Jesus went to all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. We're familiar with this threefold description of the public ministry of Jesus. Uh, It's there in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, kicking off this initial opening section. Jesus was peripatetic in his work. He moved all over the place. Uh, Do you notice the emphasis on moving and all and every there in verse 35? He moved all over the region centered around Capernaum. He taught in synagogues, presumably showing how the promise of God to deal with the sin of the world through Abraham's family was now being fulfilled in him in his person. He preached the good news of the kingdom of heaven. Remember his first public proclamation in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He proclaimed to all and sundry that the rule of God had come in himself and he displayed the physical reality of this teaching and preaching in healing the people brought to him, brought to him with those sharp reminders in their illnesses and disabilities and exclusion those sharp reminders of how broken the world truly was. Matthew has shown us this public ministry of Jesus. And in it, Matthew has helped us grasp Jesus' identity, Jesus' authority. Remember, uh, Jesus' identity as healer, and preacher, and teacher, saviour, Lord, God in the flesh, a doctor come to heal the sickness of sin in people. Jesus has been shown to have authority over the natural and the supernatural, the authority to set them straight, to set whole people right, to bring in the outsider, to deal with those, to bring them up that no one else in the world can. And constantly as we've seen the work of Jesus, we've been pushed to think about our reaction to him. This is the work of Jesus. Uh, It's not the work of of a robot. It's not the work of a man so single-minded that he was never willing to display his heart on his sleeve. Look at verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. It's a picture of Jesus that has really struck me this week. It's just kind of burrowed its way into my mind, my thoughts, the compassion of the man. It's a heartwarming and wonderful picture of him. Uh, The word used for compassion there is kind of deep in your bowels and guts kind of emotion. It's a deep-seated movement in who he is at the state of the people in front of him, at the people milling around him. Uh, Compassion. Uh, Wherever he looks, he sees people weary and worn out. Does that sound familiar to you? Wherever he looks, he sees people who are like sheep without a shepherd. It's such a resonant image, isn't it? Uh, It resonates with us because we live in a rural setting. Uh, It resonates with us because that's how we feel someday. Uh, It resonated even more with the people reading Matthew the first time, people who might have been privy to this description on the very day where it was there in Jesus' mind. It resonated with them because as they cast their minds back on the Old Testament, Ezekiel 34, we read that earlier, Numbers 27, 17, Zechariah 10, 2, 
Well, there was a description of God's people, Abraham's family, God's mob, sheep without a shepherd. It's a description that captures the state of a people who'd forgotten the commitment of God, who'd forgotten the vibrancy of the promises of God, who'd been misled and mistaught. It described a people who couldn't manage to even assess themselves rightly and needed Jesus to step in. The compassion of Jesus, how often do we see his emotions? The compassion of Jesus at this point seems to drive him. The compassion of Jesus at this point seems to reveal that the desperate need of these people is that they need to meet their shepherd. Now, this description of Jesus should cast our minds back to Matthew 2, 5 to 6, where the wise men came to Jerusalem and told the king, that the shepherd of the people of God would be born in Bethlehem. And look, here is this man. The compassion of Jesus drives him for these lost sheep to meet him, the one who can shepherd them back to whole humanity. It leads to a very clear command. Look there in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. As Jesus turns to his closest student followers, disciples, he makes an observation and then that leads to a command all driven by this compassion. The observation is clear as he looks out. There is a great harvest and there aren't many workers. Well, we know that image, don't we? The harvest refers to the people in front of Jesus, the people he'd been preparing by doing this public work, by moving all over this region, and it's only he who's been working, hasn't it? It's, it's only Jesus who's been doing anything. Even Jesus knows that that's not enough. And so a command emerges, and the command is very clear. Notice he doesn't say, go and do your latest evangelistic course. He doesn't say, just get up and get out there and get speaking. Did you notice what he said? The command is to pray. Did you hear that? It's to turn to the one who already owns the harvest and ask him to put on more staff, more workers. It's to depend upon the one who's already organised the harvest. It's not to be active in anything but to be dependent. I think that Matthew has set this little section here at the end of chapter 9, not just to summarise what's come before, but to establish the foundation for how this good news about this man, Jesus, might go out into all the peoples. To put it simply, Jesus has set the template for his work and in his work. Jesus displays the compassion that drives him. Jesus is the one who commands how this work needs to be carried out in prayer first and foremost. So here's the foundation for this good news to go out to all nations for mission to take place. The work of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, the command of Jesus to pray. There is your foundation for the good news to go to the nations. And then I think Matthew shows us what that might look like. Uh, in the next section, I'm at point three on the outline in chapter 10, 1 to 15, he, he gives us almost a manual, a, a how-to, taking those foundations and showing how they might look in real life. He immediately delegates Jesus. He immediately delegates his authority to a community. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Jesus summons 12 disciples who are called apostles. Now, this is something new. The, the number's significant. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. These men are meant to be eyewitnesses. Uh, they already have been of Jesus, eyewitnesses of his identity, his authority, his work, so that they can be sent out to represent him so that others may meet him. These men are to take on the job that God's mob always have had, to represent God to the world so the world might know him. 
It's the job only Jesus has done perfectly. And so as eyewitnesses of Jesus, they are to represent Jesus. That's why there are 12 of them, just like the original 12 tribes of Abraham's family. As Jesus summons them, and we'll meet them more closely in a moment, or oh, well, you've got their names there, he delegates authority to them. It's not any authority, not go and do what you'd like. The wording of part of verse 1, heal every disease and sickness, is word for word from Matthew 9.35. That is so important to grasp. The work of mission, of going out to tell people about this good news, starts with Jesus delegating authority. There's no other authority. No other message we'll see in a moment that empowers or legitimizes mission. Jesus delegates authority. It's authority delegated to individuals who make up a community. The number is significant, as we've just said. We're to remember the family of Abraham, the nation that came from him, God's people, Israel. We're to notice the diversity the distinct unworthy nature of this group of men. I mean, the most reputable were fishermen. But you had a tax collector and you had a number of revolutionaries and and at least a troublemaker who were set on causing revolution. And the discussion about their work is discussed always in the plural. They're individuals brought into community, delegated authority to go out and represent Jesus. Well, in essence then, Jesus has actually just answered the prayer that he commanded to be prayed. If you look back at that, it's revealing about Jesus' identity, isn't it? He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the one who can raise up more. In fact, the harvest that will come from these people is his harvest already. And the workers of the harvest are those who follow Jesus, disciples, just as he has demonstrated. And so as we've seen again and again, as Lord, Jesus defines what it looks like to follow him. In this case, what it looks like to represent the shepherd of the sheep. And that means Jesus lays out some very clear commands for these men. He establishes the audience for them. Look there in verses 5 to 7. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations. Don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's all sorts of debate that could be had here, and now's not the time. You look at this passage, there are a number of areas that are really important to look at, and we're just skating over the top. But this much is clear. Jesus sets the audience for the mission. Here it's a particular focus, Abraham's family who is broken and lost. These people need to meet the shepherd that they were promised and who they so desperately need. That's not to say that there is no global scope. Jesus has already shown that in Matthew chapter 8 in the way he spoke of the centurion. Matthew has already shown that in the opening verse and the genealogy of the whole gospel. The work of Jesus is often described as all-encompassing. The gospel finishes with a global picture, but it's Jesus who defines the audience. The proclamation is set by Jesus. As he sends them out, their role is primarily activity, displaying the authority and power of the doctor, the shepherd, the king. But there is a proclamation that goes with it. Look there in verse 7. As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Whatever else is going on here, the apostles are sent out to people to make them aware that there's a new state of affairs in the world. Something has happened to change basic reality. That means they need to meet the cause of that change, who is Jesus, the shepherd, the one that we have seen has the authority to set right the natural, the supernatural, and whole human beings. Put simply, the proclamation of the apostles in this mission is, here's Jesus. He changes the state of the world. Have you met him? As they introduce people to the kingdom, As they introduce people to the shepherd, Jesus makes clear their concern, the same concern that he has in verse 8a. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. Proclamation goes hand in hand with practice. To proclaim the kingdom is to 
practice the kingdom, to proclaim the shepherd is to show how he leads to whole life. To proclaim the doctor is to demonstrate the goodness of life under the doctor. The combination of proclamation and practice that Jesus has displayed has now been delegated to these men. To represent the shepherd is to have both a proclamation and a practice that focuses on the whole human. And the motivation for the work is very clear. Look there at the end of verse 8. You have received free of charge. Give free of charge. The compassion that Jesus had felt for these lost sheep, weary and worn out, tattered and torn, literally, overflows into grace, giving to those sheep what they do not deserve, what they cannot possibly afford, making them whole again binding them up. In that sense, the same motivation, the same flavour must permeate the work of the apostles. They've received freely the restoration that only Jesus can bring. Remember Matthew sitting by his tax booth? There to extend with all grace all of the goodness of the Lord who is now speaking to them. As they do, they are to be completely dependent They've been dependent the whole way through, these men. Uh, Matthew did nothing except respond. Dependence is part of what it means to have Jesus as Lord and God as Father. Look there in verse 9. Don't take along gold, silver or copper for your money belts. Don't take a travelling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals or a walking stick for the worker is worthy of his food. I don't think that Jesus is establishing here the clothing or luggage limits of mission work around the world across all ages. Oh, perhaps he's reminding his disciples that mission is not meant to be comfortable. I do think he's emphasising the dependence that is central to this work. Remember, pray for workers for the harvest. Uh, remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, seeking God's kingdom, knowing that our Father already knows our needs before we pray to him, just as Matthew was brought in by being dependent upon Jesus, just as every follower of Jesus is dependent upon him. So as they go out, they depend on their Father who has promised to give them what they need. Jesus even gives these workers a plan, a protocol, for dealing with acceptance and rejection. Look there in verse 11. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it. If the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. If it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. I assure you it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. In essence, Jesus is reminding them that they are his agents, his representatives, bearing his delegated authority and message. To enter a town and be accepted, well, that's to be bearers of the peace that comes from Jesus. To enter a town and be rejected, well, that's a rejection of Jesus and his peace. And their conduct must display the gravity of the situation in the big scheme of things. To reject the representatives of Jesus is to reject Jesus himself, the only one who can set all things right, the only one who brings the removal of the curse of sin, the approval of God. To reject that, well, it would be worse than the charred remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus sets out the manual for this, the first of his apostles' mission trips. He delegates his authority to them as a community of individuals, as his representatives. They are the workers to go out into the harvest which is full of broken sheep, to introduce these sheep to the shepherd who can set them right, to make them whole, deal with their sin. As we think about applying this section of Matthew, Matt point four on the outline, we must be aware that there are limits. We're not the 12 apostles in the presence of Jesus with the job of going to the lost sheep of Israel. We stand after Matthew has finished this good news gospel in the full fruit of what Jesus observed with the centurion, which Matthew made clear that this is about the whole world. So let me suggest that there are three principles that emerge. You'll see them there on your outline from what Matthew has written here. Three principles for how we think about following Jesus, being part of Jesus' mission, even how we just do life as God's mob. 
First, all mission is because of Jesus. It's important to see that this mission trip of the 12 emerges only because of Jesus and what he's already done. Without Jesus, without his work, there is no mission. There is no shepherd. We all remain broken. We all remain weary. We all remain worn out. Mission, the very being of God's people as forgiven and made whole and restored, as people with a proclamation and practice worth taking to the whole world, the very existence of mission is only because of Jesus. Secondly, all mission is about Jesus. As Jesus lays out the mission before the Twelve, it is unavoidably clear that this work is about him. It's about introducing in proclamation and practice, it's about introducing people to Jesus as he is. After all, isn't that what we've been doing for the last few chapters? The delegated authority, the message, the emphasis on grace and dependence upon the Father, all these are the hallmarks of showing people Jesus. That's worth pausing there and asking ourselves a number of questions from these two principles. Do we see mission as the proclamation and practice of Jesus? Is that how we do life as God's mob? I think that's a reasonable extension of what we've seen here. Is that how we do life as God's mob? Are, are we about the proclamation and practice of Jesus? As we slowly move back into whatever normalcy is in the future, Is our mission as God's mob here in Narrabri, our ministries even, is it about putting Jesus in front of people in what we proclaim and practice? Are we a community that seeks to bring people to know Jesus alone, to be followers of Jesus alone in how we do life as God's people? Is it obvious that we are driven by grace and compassion for broken sheep. The third principle is this. All mission is defined by Jesus. It's so important to see that the mission of these 12 men is defined completely by Jesus. They represent him. He is their Lord. And so he defines what it means to represent him. His work defines their work. His compassion drives their compassion. His message is their message. His movement all is their movement all. His motivation of grace is their motivation of grace. His dependence is their dependence. Jesus defines what it means to follow him. His work defines our work as his mob. And so that leads to some obvious questions again for us as God's mob here in Narrabri. Is our mission, are our ministries defined by Jesus? Is that what sits in the centre of the table? Are we driven by his compassion? Is our view of the mass of people around us the same as his? They are broken and weary and worn out sheep. Is our movement the same as his movement to all in all places, and I could go on. Let me pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that we can see here how the message for all peoples is to go out. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is the good doctor, the compassionate shepherd, the one who has come as God in the flesh to set whole humans aright who has the authority alone to do it. Father, thank you that as Lord of the harvest, he has seen the abundant harvest and the few workers, and thank you that he has given this role to his people. Father, we pray that we will represent Jesus to the sheep who need to meet him, that we will put him in front of them, in our proclamation and practice, that what we do as your mob here will be defined by him. And we pray that through this, many broken sheep, weary and worn out, will be brought to the shepherd they need and made whole. 
In Jesus' name. Amen.